Hello. Welcome to Little Dreamers with Vashti Harrison, a program in the all virtual 2021 Virginia Festival of the Book. I'm Sarah Lawson, Associate Director of the Virginia Center for the Book, a program of Virginia Humanities. Thanks for joining us. A couple notes before I hand the program over to our speakers. This event has optional closed captioning, which you can turn on and customize at any time using the closed captions tab at the bottom of your window. If you haven't already read today's books, we hope you will. For details about how to buy them from our bookseller for this event, UVA Bookstore, visit vabook.org, where you can also explore our full schedule and watch past events. While you're there, please consider making a donation to support the festival's ongoing work at vabook.org give. Thanks to our community partner for this event, Jefferson Madison Regional Library. We also greatly appreciate the support of all festival sponsors, donors, and community partners. Now, I'm pleased to introduce our speakers. Vashti Harrison, author illustrator of Little Leaders, Bold Women in Black History, Little Dreamers, Visionary Women Around the World, and other books, is an artist and filmmaker with a passion for storytelling. She earned her BA in Studio Art and Media Studies from UVA. And our moderator, Jocelyn Johnson. Jocelyn's stories or essays have appeared in Best American Short Stories, The Guardian, Guernica, and elsewhere. Her fiction debut, My Monticello, Five Stories, and a Novella, all set in Virginia, is forthcoming. A veteran public school art teacher, she lives and writes in Charlottesville. Thank you both for joining us today. Jocelyn, take it away. Hi, everybody. I am so excited to be here and to see you today. I am, um, as a longtime art teacher, especially, and as a writer, I'm so excited to meet you. Vashti, it's nice to see you there and to get to chat to, with you a little bit about these absolutely gorgeous books. Um, I had seen them before, and to be able to really spend time with them has been a real pleasure. So um, if you haven't seen this book, I know a lot of you are fans out there, but we've got Little Dreamers, um, Visionary Women in World History, and Little Legends, Exceptional Men in Black History, and Little Leaders, Bold Women in Black History, all gorgeous books. Um, if you're not familiar with the books, they have a, a really beautiful drawing of each person selected. They're really thoughtfully curated of who to include. And we've got artists, scientists, performers, activists, and athletes, and more. And then there's a brief one-page biography that tells something about each person and the world they live in. And I have to say, these are for all ages. My, husband's and, my husband and I had them on our nightstand. And we would go back and forth with our Kindles and our novels and our short story collections, kind of talking and noting um, things that we noticed. And the next day I would find myself at my computer looking up these people. And I know I'm not alone. I had some kid friend readers who said, um, Ellie and Lily, who are sisters, who are eight and six, who said they would Google each person after they read about them. Mm. So that's amazing. Well, thank you so much. I'm really happy to be able to be here and to talk about these books, uh, especially to share them with folks from the Virginia Festival of the Book. Um, if anyone doesn't know, I'm from Virginia, I went to the University of Virginia, and I was really looking forward to being able to come back and visit in person, but I'm still very happy to be able to attend virtually. So I'm excited. Yeah, I have a couple of my books here with me. So are you, um, I thought it'd be nice, Vashti, if you wanted to share, maybe read a bio or, that you like and maybe share a little bit about the artwork. Um, in sure. The Actually, you know what, I'm going to share a little bit about um, Little Dreamers and I'm going to read a little bit from the intro of that book to kind of give you guys a sense of, of where I was coming from when I, when I created when I went into making this book, the first one that I wrote was Little Leaders, Bold Women in Black History. And it was very much inspired by Black History Month and really feeling like I wanted to focus on the stories of Black women who I didn't necessarily hear a lot about when I was growing up. And I really wanted to put all those stories together um, because I was thinking a lot about the young version of me who would have really benefited from seeing all these different contributions that Black women have made to American history. But in going into the second book, I was really thinking about the other way I tend to define myself is as a creative. So I wanted to make a book about creative people. Um, again, I wanted to focus on the stories of women, a lot of these hidden figures who 
may not necessarily have their stories told and definitely not all in the same place. They came from such diverse backgrounds. Um, and I wanted to put the stories of women artists and scientists together um, because people often think that art and science are so separate, but I think um, it's really, it was really exciting for me when I started working on it um, to be able to put them together. So I'll, I'm just gonna read a little bit from the, bot, the intro. The women in this book looked at things differently. They saw things that no one else did. They asked questions no one else was asking and they cho chose to do something about it. Often it took a long time for others to understand them or value their efforts. Many were simply ahead of their time laying the groundwork for others. Some of them are still ahead of their time but hopefully will one day be recognized for their vision. Through their curiosity and creative thinking, these ordinary women accomplished extraordinary things. Thanks to their persistence and willingness to make mistakes, they had a long lasting impact on their fields of study and some of them even changed the world. I knew I wanted to fill this book with the stories of creative people, but I also wanted to challenge the idea of what creativity can be. It's a term commonly associated with artists rather than scientists, but both fields require crit critical thinking and inventiveness. I wanted to see all of the stories of, of these people in the same place because when their efforts cross over, amazing things can happen. Sometimes art can be incredibly technical, as in the work of Monir Shahrudi Farman Famayan, and sometimes science can require a lot of imagination, as if as with Bessie Blanc Griffin, a nurse turned inventor. And so I keep going on and on, but that's really the heart of why I wanted to share all these stories together, because I think it's really um, just such a beautiful way to um, think about what you can do with your ideas. And so, you know, I was thinking a lot about those little kids that, you know, they say, I want to be an inventor when I grow up. I, I like to make things because I was that kid always trying to, um, you know, write a story or invent a new toy or game or whatever. So um, that that was a really exciting part of working on this book for me. That that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I love the artwork in this book in particular as an art teacher and a visual person and I love how each person that you draw has a similarity, but they're so unique too. And you add these gorgeous little details uh, in the background and in the person. Can you say anything about the artwork or share anything? Yeah, for sure. Um, well, I knew that I wanted to make an illustrated book. I wasn't the kid who really like loved history growing up. So I knew that I wanted to um, kind of share all of these really fascinating and interesting stories of people in a way that might engage someone who's like me and a little bit, you know, kind of turned off from history. So I thought, okay, well, definitely this book is going to be really pretty. I want to make sure that, you know, when kids flip through those pages, there there's really interesting colors and interesting designs. But, you know, I could have drawn each of these people to look like themselves, but instead I I created what I call a little kid character. And I think of it as a little kid dressing up as these famous people. I kind of imagine that they're putting this costume on and kind of closing their eyes and imagining themselves in the worlds of these wonderful people. And I think that totally works. But another thing that I had going into creating these books was this feeling of like when I was a kid, I would watch cartoons with my cousin. And my cousin would always choose a character and say, oh, that one's me. I get to be that character. And I would always be left with like the lame character. I wouldn't get to be the cool one. So I was like, if I'm ever going to make a book, I'm going to make sure that they all kind of look the same in a way that you would want to be any one of them. And because these are the stories of real, real amazing people, I would want anyone to be able to flip through this book and, and land on a page and see a little bit of themselves and be interested in learning about, you know, what this person did. I love that idea. I thought how, how, of why they're similar, but mm -hmm. also it's totally unique. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything else you want to share before I jump into some of the kid questions that we have? Uh, if I think of it, I'll just throw it in there later. All right. That sounds great. So <laughs> I have um, a collection of questions from kids in our area. Uh, I'm going to start with a question from Abigail, who is eight years old. What inspired you to draw and write? And what is your favorite thing to draw? What inspired me to draw and write? Um, well, the secret is I was very much an insecure writer for a long time. 
pretty much, well, when I was really, really little, I used to just make up all kinds of stories. Um, before I knew how to write, I would fill up pages with just like loops, like the letter E over and over and over again. And I would take it to my parents and I would just read them a story. I would just make it up. Um, so I was really creative when I was very little, but as I got older, you know, I was a pretty shy kid. Um, and I got insecure about my writing all the way up through high school and college. It wasn't until I started taking a, a filmmaking class where I was writing about movies when I kind of discovered, oh, when I have something to say or when I'm really interested about a subject, that fear, that insecurity kind of went away. And that's what helped me get over my main fear of writing. Now, I'm still like very much insecure about my writing all the time. You know, I often, when people started calling me an author, I was like, oh, I'm an artist. I don't know if I'm an author, you guys. But what I know I really love is being able to tell a story. I like coming up with ideas for stories and maybe it will sometimes take the shape in a book. Sometimes it will be shaped into a movie for me or sometimes it'll be, a, a single painting. So I like storytelling. And so when I want to be able to tell that story, I want to have access to all kinds of tools that can help me share that story with other people. And so that's kind of how I got into writing is really learning that I wanted to share stories. And obviously I'm really um, invested and excited about the real life people in these books. And that's what gets me um, the confidence to be able to share them because I wonder what would have happened if I had learned these stories when I was a little kid? What, it, what would have happened if I had learned about Julie Dash, the filmmaker, when I was maybe like in, you know, these books are written for eight to 12 year olds. If I was eight, 10 years old, when I learned about filmmaking, I might have like picked up a camera a lot sooner. It wasn't until um, college that I started making movies. So, you know, it, it's really about that kind of passion and that joy. Um, as far as drawing though, I was always that kid who had a sketchbook and I would just sit in front of the TV, I would copy my favorite characters. I, when I got older, I would copy faces from magazines um, and, even when I got older, I would go to like life drawing classes and copy uh, models and, and sculptures. And it was kind of through learning to make movies that I realized a lot of what I was doing through my drawing and painting was copying, copying, copying. I wasn't saying a lot with my artwork um, and I wasn't making meaning with my artwork. And so it was through that process that I, you know, started learning how to, um, use the medium, use the tool that I'm using, either, you know, whether it be a pencil or a paintbrush or camera um, to make meaning or to, to shape a story with the things that I'm putting together. So, um, I mean, I think I've always loved drawing people, um, but after having gone through undergrad at UVA and then I went to film school to study movie making, I returned back to drawing after having done all that experience of learning how to tell stories. Um, and so that's how I got really interested in making books for children because I, I realized I can um, bring together the way I like to draw um, with the stories that I like to tell. That, that helps. That totally makes sense. And you actually kind of answered um, the next question from Elliot, who's 10, which was, when did you start to illustrate books? But I'm going to just add like how you kind of talked about going to film school and how you pursued mm -hmm. it. But I know so many, you know, young people and older people are like, how do you become, you know, how do you actually make art and writing and this creative work, you know? Yeah. Well, long before it was my job to do this, I was just drawing and practicing. So, I mean, one thing that I kind of skipped over in that story was that I, I kind of stopped drawing for a long time. Once I realized I was really excited about making movies, I stopped drawing from probably around the age of 20 until 26. So six years, it doesn't feel like that long, but I always compare it to running. If like you're, if you've practiced running, if you're a really fast runner all the way up through your youth, and then you stop running for six years, if you picked it up again, are you going to be as fast as you were six years ago? And all the kids are always going, no. And it's true. It's like, that is how drawing kind of works. It's not exactly like riding a bicycle. A lot of people think like art and drawing and, and painting is some 
some gift that some people have and some people don't, but it, I promise you, it is so impressive that like, if you literally just put in the work, you will get better at drawing. It's one of those things that literally everyone can do, but not everyone's willing to put in that time and work. And so when I picked up drawing again, after having done all those writing classes and filmmaking classes, um, I tried to draw and I wasn't that good. <laughs> I was like, wait a second, I used to be the best at this. Uh, but it was just so clear to me, if you don't practice, you're not going to be good. So I made it a goal of mine to start drawing every day. And that was my last year of film school. Um, uh, so I was just taking, uh, I took a class in the animation department just for fun. And I was like, I'm not good anymore, but I'm going to practice every single day until I get better. And it was just a thing that I did on my own. I, you know, I finished film school, I was showing my films at film festivals and going to, I got a job in the film industry and every night I would come home and practice my drawing. And so um, I made a choice a few years later that I wanted to try to turn illustration into my job. Um, and I started learning about the book publishing industry. But before any of that, you know, it, it was really just the practice in terms of the artwork, you know, I was, reading a lot of children's books to just kind of see how, how those stories are laid out, how the art is different from this type of book to that type of book, what kind of techniques are the artists using? So I was just, you know, investigating on my own. I like doing that kind of research. Um, and I know that a lot of people don't like doing a lot of that research, but I find that the people who are really, you know, dedicated about something are willing to just like take that time and absorb the information. So I think it starts with that. Um, but in terms of getting you know, really, really into the industry, I joined SCBWI, the Society of Children's Books Writers and Illustrators. I kept doing my research and I put my artwork out there on social media and I met my agent. And actually before I met my agent, I got offered a, a, an opportunity to illustrate a book. That was my first book, Festival of Colors, that I illustrated. And, and really it was just kind of, like a snowball <laughs> it's been going since then so i i tried to start you know focusing on illustration about five years ago this month spring of 2016 um and i took a trip to charlottesville and i went into a used bookstore on the corner and i bought this book i had never heard of this artist but i was like really kind of stricken by the the illustrations, struck by the illustrations, and they are just so lovely and so wonderful. And this is uh, illustrate, written and illustrated by Gyo Fujikawa, who is- it's in your book, right? Yes, yes, who is in, in <laughs> Little Dreamers, Visionary Women Around the World. And I didn't really realize, I didn't put this together, but I am so uh, happy that it happened this way, that when I decided I wanted to focus on, on children's story, um, illustrating for children and writing for children, that the person who gave me so much inspiration was this woman, this Asian American artist, Gyo Fujikawa, who I wrote about in Little Dreamers. And what's so impressive about her is um, she was really one of the first to make very diverse books. Um, she put children of, of as many races and colors in her books in a way that no one was doing before her. And she was very much a pioneer of making sure that there were books for every child out there. And I feel so grateful that, you know, she was the person who introduced, who, who really introduced me into this kind of um, uh, pedagogy or paradigm for, for making children's books. So um, she's a very big inspiration for me. Um, and I really loved writing about her. Okay, so this is a great lead into another question we have from, uh, 10 year old Maria, um, how did you find out the information? How did you find out the information to put into these books? So did you yeah. do research? Did you? That's a good question. So you, so I always start with the names and, and so this is a good example. Like I didn't grow up knowing Kyo Fujikawa's name, but you know, it was through, through like kind of, kind of research and going through bookstores and finding the artists that are really inspiring. Um, so some of them came from my personal encounters and others came from reading about um, these interesting people. So like one of my favorite examples is I wrote about um, a filmmaker that I, 
I, I learned about in film school. So some of these names come from my art practice of having gone, gone to school and learn about film. And so Maya Darren is one of the first people you might learn about when you're learning about experimental film, but I didn't realize that she was a personal assistant to the dancer and choreographer, Catherine Dunham. And I didn't even know who Catherine Dunham was. So it was through the process of doing the research on this person that I learned about someone really, really amazing and impressive. So that's one of my favorite things about these books is finding the connections, but a few of them were brand new to me. And it was through reaching out to friends, um, um, sometimes from art school, sometimes through through the art world, um, to find out about um, you know really special names that that maybe are not so famous here in America. So it was a mixture of like really relying on on some help from from my community and and really digging into history. So like. Um, another another of my favorite examples is Aiko Ishioka, who is a production designer for films. Um, I watched a movie and I thought, wow, the costumes in this movie are so, so beautiful. And so I started doing research on who designed the costumes. And it's like, there are these really famous men who get <laughs> credit for making these beautiful movies. But a lot of the things that people are hooking onto are the costumes and the production design and the set design. And so I realized that Aiko Ishioka designed um, some of the most famous movies that people um, kind of categorize as like the most inventive and creative. And it's, this woman is behind all of these impressive movies. So it's a little bit of, of digging into um, the things that you're interested in um, and, and reaching out to very smart people for help sometimes. I love, I love um, how you, it's, there's a little bit of a luck and serendipity, like what For you sure. Um, in terms of the research, I do wanna say like, I, I like to get as much information from that person's own experience as possible. So I like to read autobiographies. I like to see interviews with these people if possible to hear from their own perspective, how these things, these big things in their lives felt for them. Because I think that's what makes me connect to their stories is knowing, you know, they were real people. They weren't just like a headline. They weren't just a hashtag. They were real people that were just going through these things and, you know, um, experiencing challenges and and really, you know, sometimes really difficult things. So um, it's a mixture of watching as many kind of documentaries or interviews or reading autobiographies as possible, and then you know, a mixture of research. And I put in um, in the back of the book a lot of sources for where you can continue your research. Like there, there are really great websites. Like, like. Um, I think I think I spent a lot of time on like Guggenheim.org. Um, Art Twenty One is really helpful. I remember watching a lot of Art Twenty One documentaries in, in graduate school, um, and then a lot of my sources are back here as well. Oh my gosh, our time's going so quick. Oh I'm no, gonna, I'm sorry. I have no, no, long no. I, answers. I love your. I'm, <laughs> I love it. Um, so I'm going to ask a question from Amaya, who's eleven, and I know that he read. I happen to know that he read. Um, exceptional black men in his uh, mm -hmm. exceptional men in black history and his question was um, how did you decide to write a book about african-american men and their achievements and do you plan to write uh, about people of other ethnicities and their achievements which he you know didn't have visionary women around the world right. in front of him but I would just go on to say um, I know you talked a little bit about it in your intros because I read all mm -hmm. your intros but just what was important to you, you said a little bit about this, about collecting and sharing these particular stories or why did you choose to do that? Yeah, I mean, at, at this point, after having all of the books out, I really love seeing them all together and, and knowing that you can really do a deep dive into this specific category of black women and black men. Um, but it started it started with writing just one book, the first book, which was inspired by Black History Month. So um, I was doing, it, was, it wasn't even a book when I started doing it. It was just a challenge for myself to draw a woman every day. And I, was, I, I wanted to do it for Black History Month of 2017, so four years ago. Um, and I was reading about 
Carter G. Woodson, who founded it, he founded Negro History Week in 1926. And he said that he wanted to celebrate the stories that have been long neglected throughout history. And I thought, wow, that is, that's really great. And I, maybe this is a great opportunity to celebrate the stories of black women in particular, whose stories have been doubly neglected throughout history because they're both black and women. So it was really about shining a light on these people whose stories hadn't been told. But as soon as like I had the opportunity to turn it into a book, the, one of the first questions that people were asking me is, when are you gonna do a book for boys? And my answer was, this is a book for boys. There are stories in here that are for everyone. But I knew what they were asking. I knew that so many people were seeing this book as a mirror, as a reflection of themselves. And they really wanted their young, you know, young people in their lives, their sons or, anyone to be able to have that same mirror as well. And, and I understood what they were asking for. And part of me was like, maybe I won't be the right person to write this book. Little Leaders was so personal of an experience. But it was through the process of writing the second book that I really had to step out of myself and learn how to tell stories with people who don't come from my same backgrounds, that I learned that I was growing as an author. So I really was thinking a lot about the the folks out there who wanted that book. That's why I definitely worked on Little Legends, Exceptional Men in Black History. I asked a friend from, from art school to help me write it though, um, because he was talking about his experience of raising his own son. And I was like, I don't have that experience. I really want that. I want this to feel as, as honest and special as Little Leaders was for so many people. Um, so, uh, so for the kids, kids who were asking, I wanted those books. I wanted to write that book for you just to, to hopefully see a reflection of yourself or use it as a window to learn about someone else's experience. Um, but you know, what I'm hoping for next is to be able to make books that are inclusive of everyone. You know, I really love that special mirror, but I want, you know, I, I think it's really important to be able to hold up these books next to each other and see, you know, the similarities and the differences and to see all these contributions that really special people have made to make this world a, a, an interesting place. These are so gorgeous. Thank you. I love, I love hearing <laughs> that. I'm going to sneak in one last question from Manan, who's eight. And this is so specific and small. He said, my favorite character was Langston Hughes. Mm -hmm. You said, and this is kind of a compliment to your writing. You said that poetry, that his poetry was influenced by music and that it flowed it, uh, it flowed and had rhythm. Why did you choose that metaphor? <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you for the craft question. <laughs> Love that. You know, I, I really tried to put myself, I mean, I, as, a, as a person who writes for kids and makes artwork for kids, I tried to really hold on to who I was when I was their age, you know? Um, and so I was thinking about how I didn't really like poetry when I was young. I was kind of scared of it. I didn't think I understood it. But, you know, what I love about Langston Hughes poems now is knowing that he was so largely influenced by jazz. And if I think, I think if I had known that, that it was musical and that was different and that was exciting and it was an interesting new way to approach language, I think I might have been a little bit more intrigued to learn more as a young person. So I was thinking about, you know, how can I make um, my description of, of this work feel interesting for a young person while also like hopefully representing him, him in the best way possible. I love that. Okay, so um, we just have a moment left. Um, is there anything else you want to share and then I'll and us up. Uh, no, I'm happy to answer any more questions. If people have extras, they can just um, send me to my website or, or to my Twitter or something like that. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing. And uh, these books are gorgeous. I know people who have prints in their homes. And so um, you're very loved, beloved, and your work. Um, you. So it's time for us to wrap things up. Um, thank you to Vashti and thank you to everyone who is watching. Uh, please consider buying Little Dreamers or any of the other books at your local independent bookseller or you can use there are several links in the chat that you can go to and we hope you enjoy other events at the all virtual 2021 Virginia Book Fest and you can go to vabook.org. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of your day. Thank you again Vashti.
Thank you so much. I do want to say that I'm on one more panel for the Virginia Festival of the Book. Um, it's called I See Myself, Diversity in Children's Literature. It's on Thursday, uh, March 25th from 4 to 5 p.m. with Angela Dominguez and Dub Leffler. So that one should be really fun as well. All right, I'm going to have to check that out. All right, you all have mm -hmm. a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you.